Thanks, Angela, so much for that introduction. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Narasimhan is uh, one of my favorite former students from the Maxwell School at Syracuse. So it's uh, it's great to uh, get a chance to see her and get a chance to meet uh, all of you. And so and so thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, so our topic today is um, judicial politics in polarized times. I thought we'd talk a little bit about the uh, impending election and its likely impact on the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and then use that as a little bit of an entree into talking uh, a little bit about my own recent work on the role of courts in settling or attempting to settle um, uh, certain highly polarized political conflicts um, in the United States. And so I thought we'd start with this guy. Um, Justice Scalia passed away um, earlier this year. May he rest in peace. Um, uh, Antonin Scalia was himself a quite polarizing uh, legal figure and the um, struggle over naming a replacement for him on the Supreme Court um, has been a polarizing political debate uh, under our Constitution. Um, the president gets to nominate Supreme Court justices, so it's this guy's job. And he nominated this guy. Um, that's Merrick Garland on the, uh, my left there. Uh, Merrick Garland is a sitting judge on the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, and he is President Obama's pending nominee to the Supreme Court to replace Justice Scalia. Um, Merrick Garland is a highly distinguished federal judge. Um, he's unquestionably well qualified um, for the Supreme Court, both on the sort of conventional grounds of his, his um, educational and professional record as a law student and lawyer and judge, um, and also on the grounds of um, just sort of uh, widespread recognition and support. Uh, all of uh, Judge Garland's Republican colleagues on the D.C. Circuit um, have been ha have praised him to, to no end. Um, there's a long record of comments by Republican senators um, praising Judge Garland's record. Not this year, right? This year, Republican senators haven't been saying anything nice about him. But in previous Supreme Court vacancies, right? President Obama has named two previous justices to the Supreme Court, and in both of those on both of those occasions, Republican senators floated Merrick Garland's name as somebody that President Obama um, should consider because he's a widely respected moderate Democratic judge. Um, uh, and so, um, so that's the nominee. Of course, the president under our constitutional system doesn't get to make this decision by himself, right? So this guy, uh, Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader, um, uh, publicly stated very shortly after Justice Scalia's death um, that the Senate would not consider any nominee put forward by President Obama, um, that it should be up to the next president to name our Supreme Court justice. We have an election coming up, obviously. Now it's only two weeks away. At the time, it was almost a year away. Um, uh, but um, uh, the Senate Majority Leader's position is that the next president should name our next Supreme Court justice. And so it's going to be one of these folks. Um, so. That leads me to suggest that we should spend a little time thinking about what kind of justices Hillary Clinton, President Hillary Clinton, or President Donald Trump would put on the Supreme Court. Now, I should note, just as an aside, um, there is still a significant possibility that Merrick Garland is going to get confirmed to this vacancy, right? The, um, uh, the election's in two weeks. Um, everybody should turn out. Vote for your favorite candidate. Um, uh, go work the polls. Go go knock on some doors. Help out your favorite candidate win. Uh, Democratic citizenship very, is very important. Um, so as a citizen, the election is not over till it's over, and everybody should participate. As a political scientist, it's looking pretty clear who's going to win, right? Uh, if all if the polls are correct, Hillary Clinton has a commanding lead in the popular vote and the electoral college, um, and so she's very likely to be our next president. Um, this is a lot closer, but it also looks like there's a decent chance that the Democrats are going to recapture the Senate. If both of those things happen, if Hillary Clinton wins the presidency and Democrats recapture the Senate, there is a significant likelihood that the Republican Senate leadership in December, during the lame duck session, will confirm Merrick Garland, which they still have the right and authority to do so, right? The election's in November, but the new senators and new president aren't seated until January. Meantime, the old office holders are still in place. If they don't confirm Garland, Hillary Clinton is likely to nominate somebody 20 years younger. Right? Merrick Garland is a compromised candidate because he's 64 years old. And because Supreme Court justices are appointed for life, the older somebody is, the shorter his or her term on the Supreme Court is. Right? So if Republican senators, if they're acting according to their rational partisan self-interest, will confirm Merrick Garland in December. Um, but if they don't, one of these guys uh, is going to name the next replacement. And even if they do confirm Judge Garland, um, there's a very strong possibility that 
our next president is going to get to name at least one Supreme Court justice. Now, presidential candidates say this every year, every four years. Um, every presidential election, presidential candidates and their supporters say, oh, oh yeah, really important to vote. One of the reasons it's so important to vote is because the, the fate of the Supreme Court hangs in the balance, right? Lifetime appointments are going to be made by our next president. They're going to control the, the, the future of the Supreme Court for the next 30 years. That is not always actually true, right? They say it every four years, and sometimes it's hyperbole, right? So like in the 2000 election, George W. Bush versus Al Gore, there was lots of discussion on the campaign trail about the future of the Supreme Court hanging in the balance. And then there were no actual vacancies on the Supreme Court during the next four years. So that election had no direct effect on the future of the Supreme Court. But this year, it's really true, right? It's really true. We're quite confident it is really true. There is one vacancy already, right? That, uh, that what's going to happen with Scalia's vacancy hinges on the outcome of the election. Um, and there are three other justices, current justices, in their 80s. Right? They're all in good health, knock on wood. I wish them all the best, but they're only going to stay on the court so long. Um, and Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer, in particular, are likely to retire. If Hillary Clinton is elected president, and particularly if there's a Democratic Senate, um, in the next two years, both Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer will likely step down from the court, meaning even if Merrick Garland is confirmed in December of this year, our next president will appoint one or likely two Supreme Court justices. Um, so what do these folks say? What kind of justice are they going to appoint? Thankfully, um, the tough subject has come up uh, in a couple of the presidential debates. Raise your hand if you watched all three of the presidential debates. Raise your hand if you saw the second and third. Saw the second, the third. And I'm mostly going to talk about the second and third. All right, so, um, so in the second presidential debate, um, uh, this was the town hall format one, so there's a question from the audience from an ordinary voter. The question was, uh, good evening, perhaps the most important aspect of this election is the Supreme Court. What would you prioritize as the most important aspect of selecting a Supreme Court justice? That's what the question was. And here is part of Hillary Clinton's answer. I'll let you read that for a second while I have a drink of water. You guys see that over here? And I'll give you Donald Trump's answer as well. So I know that's a lot of text to throw at you. I, I tried to shorten the quotes as much as I could, but I didn't want to leave anything out because there's some important stuff in there. Now, um, these are pretty straightforward answers. They're, they're fairly standard answers for what do Democratic and Republican presidential candidates say about the Supreme Court. But it's important to hit on a couple points here. Um, so Hillary Clinton says, um, I want Supreme Court justices who are going to reverse Citizens United. Citizens United, landmark campaign finance decision in 2010 um, that opened the floodgates to significantly larger uh, campaign contributions and spending by wealthy individuals and corporations. Uh, I want to reverse that. I want a Supreme Court that's going to um, better defend voting rights. I want a Supreme Court that's going to defend abortion rights in Roe versus Wade. I want a Supreme Court that's going to defend um, marriage equality, right? Uh, Donald Trump's answer is basically, it, it's shorter, it's fewer things on his list, right? He basically says the Second Amendment, right? He says, well, I want a justice who's just like Justice Scalia. He was great, so he's my motto. I want a justice who's just like that. And then the one specific issue that he emphasizes here um, is the Second Amendment, which protects the right to bear arms, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, the issue came up again in the third presidential debate. So I'm going to throw two long quotes at you again, but I'm going to highlight um, a couple of parts of them. So um, this was the one moderated by Chris Wallace, the third one, which was a nice format, right? So there were, I think, five or six different segments. Supreme Court was the first one. So if you turned it on late, you missed this part, um, where he asked an opening question to each candidate. Um, but then he also had some follow-up questions on the same topic where he tried to drill down and, and get them to give more detailed answers. Um, so it produced a pretty nice, uh, somewhat more in-depth discussion of the Supreme Court in this debate. Um, the gist of e these answers is the same, right? Hillary Clinton has her same list of issues, Citizens United, uh, uh, voting rights, abortion rights, and the like. Um, Donald Trump again talks about the Second Amendment. 
um, and, the, and, and the rhetoric, again, is, is familiar. If you've ever followed what Republican and Democratic politicians say about the Supreme Court in the past, there's some familiar rhetoric here. Donald Trump talks about adhering to the original meaning of the Constitution. Hillary Clinton talks about a Supreme Court that is, that is representative of the country as a whole and that understands the impact of law on ordinary folks. Um, that, that's a rhetorical line that President Obama has used as well. Um, and if you followed the discussion um, uh, where Chris Wallace pushed them with some follow-up questions, um, that discussion focused on, on two issues in particular that, that where they devoted the most time to. And so I'll highlight those. Um, one was abortion rights, which Hillary Clinton first brought up, but then Chris Wallace followed up on. Um, and the other was gun rights, right, which Donald Trump first brought up and, and Chris Wallace followed up on. For me, the interesting thing about the focus on these two issues, right, so abortion rights and gun rights. The interesting thing about the focus on these two issues um, is that it makes clear that Democrats and Republicans don't disagree on whether we want a Supreme Court that is actively defending constitutional rights. They agree on that. They disagree on which constitutional rights it should be actively defending. Right? So Democrats want the Supreme Court to be actively defending abortion rights, and they are less concerned with gun rights, and in fact, in some ways, are opposed to gun rights. Right? They think we should have stricter legislative restrictions on gun ownership. And for Republicans, it's the reverse. They want the courts to be actively defending gun rights, and they don't care as much about abortion rights, and in fact, are actively opposed to abortion rights. They want legislators to be passing stricter legislative restrictions on abortion. So again, Democrats and Republicans don't disagree on whether the court should be actively defending constitutional rights. They just disagree on which rights it should be protecting. So I'm going to say that this description is indisputably true. I know it's true because it's in both of those books that Professor Narasimhan just talked about. So it must be true, <laughs> as both these books say it. Um, uh, so it's indisputably true, right? that Democrats and Republicans both want the Supreme Court to be actively defending constitutional rights. They just disagree about which rights it should be actively protecting. Despite being indisputably true, the way we talk about the courts never quite catches up with this reality. If you follow most public discussion of the Supreme Court, what is the role of the court? What is it supposed to be doing? Um, you hear one of two stories. Right? Neither of which is really accurate. Right? If you follow most public discussion of the Supreme Court, you hear one of two stories. Um, the first story goes like this. Um, judges neutrally apply the law. They seek to vindicate the Constitution's original understanding, regardless of their own political preferences. They just apply the rules as written. Judges are like umpires. Right? This is the analogy that Chief Justice Roberts, he wasn't Chief Justice Roberts yet, John Roberts, uh, DC Circuit Judge John Roberts used in his confirmation hearings before the Senate Judiciary Committee when President Bush had nominated him to be just justice. He said, I'm just going to call him like I see him. I'm just calling balls and strikes. The judge's role is a relatively modest one. Nobody goes to the base. You can't have a baseball game without an umpire, for sure. But it's a relatively modest role. Nobody goes to the game to watch the umpire. And if you wind up paying lots of attention to the umpire, it's kind of probably because something went wrong. right? It's a relatively modest role, and it's a neutral role. The umpire is just applying the rules. That's story number one. right? Um, if you've um, ever uh, followed uh, judicial confirmation hearings closely, um, so this one was a while ago, this is a decade ago now, 2005, um, but then Samuel Alito was confirmed the following year, and then President Obama nominated um, both Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan. Um, and if you follow any of these confirmation hearings, there's another story that you sometimes hear. Um, the story of judges as umpires is the story that the nominee tells. Right? And sometimes his or her supporters in the Senate tell the story too. Oh, yeah, yeah, John Roberts, he's going to be great. He's super fair, neutral. He's going to be awesome. He's just going to be like an umpire. He's not going to be trying to uh, assume too much authority. Um, but senators on the other side, right? the senators who are opposed to the nomination, so Democratic senators during these hearings or Republican senators during Sonia Sotomayor's hearings, um, tell a different story. 
So this is um, Senator Chuck Schumer shaking hands with Samuel Alito down at the bottom there. Uh, and then Senator Jeff Sessions uh, shaking hands with Sonia Sotomayor up at the top. Um, they're glad handing here. Um, I just found those two pictures that I thought looked nice parallel there. Um, uh, everybody's happy when they're shaking hands for the photographer. But if you actually watch the hearings or read the transcripts, right, both Schumer and Sessions asked very tough questions of these nominees and, um, and made very pointed criticisms of their judicial records. Both Samuel Alito and Sonia Sotomayor, at the time they were nominated to the Supreme Court, had already been federal judges for quite a number of years, right? More than a decade, each of them. Um, so they have a long history of judicial decisions. And if you listen to the way they described their own approach to judging, eh, like judges are like umpires, right? We're just calling it like we see it. We're just enforcing the rules that were written down by somebody else. But if you listen to how Chuck Schumer described Samuel Alito's judicial record, or how Jeff Sessions described Sonia Sotomayor's judicial record, you heard a very different story that went like this. Um, uh, these judges are, um, are, are imposing their will on the country. They are ignoring the law. They're not just enforcing the Constitution as it was written. They are making stuff up and reading it into the Constitution based on their own preferred policy positions. That is the story that opposition senators tell at these hearings. So we have two stories about judges. Judges are like umpires or judges are unaccountable tyrants. Um, both of these stories are completely wrong, right? They're, they're just like preposterous descriptions of what judges actually do. There's like a germ of truth in each one, right? But taken by itself as a single sentence description of what judges actually do, they are not accurate. <laughs> judges are not simply umpires, and nor are they simply unaccountable tyrants. Just not accurate. But these stories are really hard to get rid of, right? Despite being preposterously inaccurate, <laughs> right? Despite lots of scholars writing books that only their students read, right? Um, uh, uh, that try to disabuse us of these stories. Um, uh, uh, the stories live on, right? It's really hard to get rid of them. Um, one of the reasons it's hard to get rid of them is because they are quite long standing and have deep historical roots. Do I have any Alexander Hamilton fans here? I gotta have at least one Alexander Hamilton fan. I got one in the back. All right. So. Um, <laughs> Here's Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. Not the real ones, um, right? Um, that's Thomas Jefferson in the awesome coat with the mic there. And that's Alexander Hamilton uh, in green. Uh, it's really David Diggs and Lin-Manuel Miranda on Broadway. Uh, right here, they're engaged in a um, rap battle about Hamilton's proposal um, to charter a national bank and have the federal government assume the debts of the state governments incurred during the Revolutionary War, if that sounds crazy. You have to see the musical and listen to the music. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, unfortunately, Lin-Manuel Miranda has not put Alexander Hamilton's Federalist Number 78 to music. So you are going to have to read it. Just trust me on this. Uh, you cannot listen to it. Um, if you want to listen to the debate about the National Bank, you can listen to it. Um, but if you want to learn about what Alexander Hamilton said about the courts, you're going to have to read Federalist 78. But I'll give you the cliff note version here. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78 says judges are like umpires. He doesn't actually say that because they didn't have baseball yet, right? But that is basically what he says, right? In the Federalist number 78, Alexander Hamilton says, life tenure judges, nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid of, no problem. All they're going to do is enforce the rules that we have written down in the Constitution. We wrote these rules down for a reason. They're important. We want somebody to enforce them. That's what the judges are going to do. That's all they're going to do. Nothing to worry about. Judges are like umpires, even though he didn't have the word umpire uh, at his disposal. Um, uh, if you've read any of the Federalist Papers, uh, um, you know that they were written by Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay. Uh, if you've listened to the musical, you know that Alexander Hamilton wrote 51 of them in six months, because um, that's in there. Uh, they were written by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay um, in an effort to defend the newly proposed Constitution. And pretty much every single one of them is a response to other public pamphlets that were being written in opposition 
to the newly proposed Constitution. So in Federal 78, Hamilton is responding um, uh, to Robert Yates, who wrote under the pen name Brutus. Um, and in several uh, uh, essays published under the name Brutus, um, Robert Yates was highly critical of the new proposed federal court system under the brand new Constitution. Um, and if you read Robert, if you read Brutus's essays uh, um, from this period, um, they sound like modern critiques of judicial activism. Right? These judges are going to be out of control. Uh, these guys say they're just going to enforce the Constitution, but who knows what that thing means? They're going to like make stuff up as they go along. Their power is unreviewable. They're appointed for life. If they strike down a law, there's nothing we can do about it. Judges are unaccountable tyrants, right? So both of these stories go back all the way to the beginning. I'm telling you they're not accurate, right? But I can't make them go away, right? They've been around for a long time. You're going to hear them. You're going to hear them. If you, hear, if you listen to people on TV talking about the courts, you're going to hear these stories. Uh, I'm telling you they're not accurate. And so what I want to do now for the rest of our time is look at some modern Supreme Court cases, some recent Supreme Court cases, um, and just think a little bit about how we should understand these decisions. If these two stories are wrong, then, then what is it that's going on? Um, so let's go back to the two issues um, that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were talking about um, in the debates. And I will give you a quick, quick overview of what the Supreme Court has had to say about each of these issues, and then we'll, we'll think a little bit about them. Um, so abortion rights. Uh, for 40 some years, the Supreme Court has issue, been issuing decisions about abortion rights. Roe versus Wade, of course, gets it all started in 1973, where the Supreme Court says uh, um, that uh, the, the 14th Amendment's protection of personal liberty um, includes a woman's decision to terminate a pregnancy. Right? So state laws, the state law from Texas that was at issue in this case, imposed, imposed a complete and total criminal ban on abortion um, with no exceptions unless the pregnant woman's life was in immediate jeopardy. Right? That law is unconstitutional. Violates a woman's personal liberty as protected by the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, this is not a full list of all the Supreme Court's abortion rights decisions, but it's just some highlights. 20 years later, the Supreme Court reaffirms that decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey but also chips away at it, right? What happens over time is the court keeps repeatedly reaffirming Roe versus Wade, but sometimes cutting back on the scope of its protections. So Planned Parenthood versus Casey allows the states to impose more restrictions on abortion than had previously been allowed, but they still can't outlaw it altogether. Um, in Stenberg versus Carhartt, in 2000, the Supreme Court um, strikes down a particular kind of restriction that they say goes too far. Um, uh, Donald Trump was alluding somewhat inaccurately um, to this uh, issue um, in the third presidential debate where he talked about certain controversial late-term abortion procedures. Um, in Stenberg versus Carhartt, uh, the state of Nebraska had banned a rarely used and controversial abortion procedure known as partial birth abortion. Its medical term is actually dilation and extraction, but opponents of the procedure call it partial birth abortion. Um, Nebraska banned it, um, and the Supreme Court struck that law down. Um, seven years later, the Supreme Court basically changed its mind on that point. Um, the federal government uh, in 2003, when George W. Bush was president, passed a federal ban on partial birth abortion, and the Supreme Court upheld it in Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Uh, and then most recently, just this year, back in June, uh, in a case from the state of Texas, the Supreme Court invalidated uh, a couple um, uh, 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 restrictive regulations of abortion um, that, again, did not outlaw the practice altogether, but made it more difficult for women to access it. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the restrictions required all abortions to be performed in ambulatory surgical centers, even non-surgical abortions, which doesn't really make any sense, right? Not like. Some abortions require surgery and some don't. An ambulatory surgical center is a particular uh, classification under state health regulations that requires all kinds of uh, specific regulations about the width of the hallways so stretchers can get through and the like. Um, all abortions had to be performed in ambulatory surgical centers whether surgery was involved or not. Supreme Court struck that down in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt. Um, let's think about gun rights for a second. Um, the list here is shorter because the Supreme Court has not had as much to say and not for as long a time about gun rights. But there are two landmark decisions from the Supreme Court over the past decade. Uh, in 2008, in a case called District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court struck down uh, the ban on handgun possession that was on the books in Washington, D.C. And two years later, the Supreme Court struck down a very similar ordinance that was on the books in Chicago, Illinois. Both of those laws basically made it illegal for anybody to lawfully own a handgun, unless you're a law enforcement officer, 
within the uh, jurisdictions of those cities. Um, those are the only two decisions the Supreme Court has issued that are directly about the Second Amendment in my lifetime. Um, because there's only two, I thought I'd add one more recent decision, which is from a lower court. Um, since Heller and McDonald, there have been lots of lawsuits challenging lots of other restrictions on gun ownership. And none of those have made it back to the Supreme Court yet, but some lower courts have been ruling on them. So here's one recent one from this year. Colbay versus Hogan is from the state of Maryland, um, which enacted a law banning the possession of semi-automatic assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. And a three-judge panel of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals declared that law unconstitutional as a violation of the Second Amendment um, earlier this year. Um, none of these decisions um, uh, or let me say, neither of these sets of decisions, we have two sets of decisions here from the Supreme Court, um, neither of them, I think, is it accurate to say, are examples of judges just deciding on things based on the clear written language of the Constitution, nor are they examples of judges just making stuff up and imposing their will on the country. Um, uh, neither of those is accurate. Um, in both cases, judges are drawing on constitutional language that is clearly relevant, but does not clearly provide answers to these modern day questions of what exactly kind of abortion restrictions or what exactly kind of gun ownership restrictions are allowed, that, that there's no clear answers in the Constitution, but there is some text that's relevant. Um, and the judges are doing the best to interpret those provisions of the Constitution in a context that is very different 200 and some years later and apply it as best they can. And for the most part, um, the judges have done this in ways that have broad public support. The justices of the Supreme Court have protected constitutional rights, both abortion rights and gun rights, for the most part, in ways that have broad public support. Um, I'll come back to that point in just a second. So um, with these decisions in mind, let's just think a little bit about the two stories that I presented you with. And I'm going to throw a little bit of data at you from my book um, uh, that I just put some of these decisions in context. Right? So again, our first question is whether judges are helpfully understood as umpires. Um, one way we could think about this question is um, whether um, judges appointed by Democratic and Republican presidents decide um, tough constitutional questions in similar ways, right? Now, if you're a baseball fan, like umpires are not all the same, right? Some of them got a strike zone that's a little higher, some's a little lower, right? Um, they're not all the same, but we would be unhappy as baseball fans if the umpires were like easily distinguishable into two different like sets of umpires where one set was always doing it this way and the other set was always doing it this way, that doesn't sound right, right? That is not, I think, what we want our baseball umpires doing, right? And so if judges are umpires, we don't want our judges doing that either. Um, uh, on the Supreme Court at any one time, we only have nine justices that we can study. But if you study um, the courts more broadly, right, there's hundreds of federal judges out there who are either appointed by a Democratic president or a Republican president. And so we can study systematically um, whether they decide these kinds of cases similarly or differently. Um, and so now this data I'm going to show you is, is not just abortion and gun rights. It's for, this is the data from the book where it's four different issues combined together. So it's abortion, affirmative action, gay rights, and gun rights um, all, all aggregated together over a 20-year period. This is every decision I could identify um, issued by a federal appellate court. So like that first Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals gun rights decision that we just looked at. Um, 300 and some decisions all together on these four highly polarized issues. Um, and there's a 32.9% percentage point difference between how Democratic judges decide these cases and how Republican judges decide them. That, se that seems pretty big. That doesn't sound like umpiring to me, right? These guys don't necessarily have the final word. All of these decisions are p potentially appealable to the Supreme Court, although these guys hear thousands of cases collectively a year, and the Supreme Court only hears 70 cases a year. So the Supreme Court's actual ability to like get everything straight is sometimes in question. But it's at least theoretically possible that the Supreme Court could be correcting this pattern but that's not happening, right? The justices, this is a much smaller sample of cases, but the justices are dividing on party lines just as much as the lower court judges. So in my mind, this does not look like umpiring, 
right? Two readily distinguishable sets of judges that are deciding the same legal issues, applying the same written rules, but reaching opposite results a substantial portion of the time. On the other hand, when I first started looking at these numbers, I was like, well, what, like, what, what's the baseline? Like, what are we comparing this to? If you're looking for umpiring, especially if you're looking for some like made up mythical version of umpiring, which people seem to mean when they say judges are like umpires, right, where every judge has the same strike zone. If that's what you're looking for, the number should be zero, right? There's no reason that Democratic and Republican umpires should have different strike zones, right? The number should be zero. But that's kind of an unrealistic assumption, right? Given the kinds of issues that we are talking about, these are four of the most polarized political and legal issues that our country has faced over this 20 year period. Um, so that's kind of an unrealistic assumption. And if you have the opposite baseline, if you think judges are just tyrants imposing their will on us, then why aren't these numbers 100%? What? I thought Democratic judges would always support abortion rights and Republican judges would always oppose them. That's not happening either, right? This is somewhere in the middle. So now this gets to be a little bit more difficult to evaluate. And so when I was working on the book, I was like, well, what, what could we use as a baseline? Like, how, how do we evaluate this number of 33%, right? What, is, that, is that too high or too low? What can we compare it to? So I said, oh, let's compare it to some other institutions that address these very same issues. This is the same four issues over the same 20 year period, right? I counted up every roll call vote taken in the House and the Senate and the US Congress on abortion, affirmative action, gay rights, or gun rights. The judges don't look so bad now, <laughs> right? Uh, members of Congress are so far polarized, at least on these kind of issues, right? that the judges, the courts, look like they might potentially be a site of cross-partisan compromise, at least relatively speaking, right? Given the highly polarized nature of our political system, courts are among our least polarized institutions. They are still polarized, but they are not as badly polarized as the rest of the political system. And in the book, I give lots of examples of specific cases where Republican and Democratic judges have joined together. The law seems clear. Republican and Democratic judges both come out the same way. There's case after case after case that looks like that, right? So we got kind of a glass half empty, half full story here. Um, real quick, let's look at the other story. Our judges, tyrants. Um, here I'm gonna show you some public opinion data. Right, uh, focus mostly on abortion and gun rights. Um, so first we got gun rights. Um, this is a, a set of data, I'll walk you through it, um, from 1993 up until last year uh, from a survey conducted by Pew Research Center. It's a question that they've asked over and over again that says, what do you think is more important to protect the right of Americans to own guns or to control gun ownership? All right, so that's a nice question that gives the public a kind of trade-off kind of question. Which one of these things is more, more important? The blue line is gun rights. The orangish line is gun control. So it used to be the case throughout the 1990s um, that there was much more public support for gun control. But since uh, 2008, 2009, you can see that the American public has been closely divided on this issue, right? It's a highly polarized issue. The American public is closely divided. Roughly half the country says gun control is important, more important than the other half says Gun rights are more important. But if you look at the specific issue on which the court ruled in District of Columbia versus Heller and McDonald versus Chicago, remember uh, Washington DC and um, Chicago, Illinois, both had total bans on lawful handgun possession. This is a survey from Gallup that goes back to 1959. Do you think there should or not should not be a law that would ban the possession of handguns? Um, the very first time they asked it, in 1959, was the only time a majority of the American people said yes, we support a ban on handgun possession. At the time of District of Columbia versus Heller uh, in 2008 and McDonald versus Chicago in 2010, <coughs> less than 30% of the public supports such a law. So the court is protecting a right here. It's protecting the Second Amendment right to bear arms, 
in particular, the right to own a gun uh, for purposes of self-defense in your home is the way it's framed in these cases. And that right is broadly supported by the American public. The law that this court is striking down in this case it does not have much support amongst the American public, less than 30%. And so I don't think it makes any sense to describe this case as an example of judicial tyranny. Right? The court is issuing decisions that have broad public support. Same thing with abortion. Um, uh, this is another Gallup poll. Um, uh, they've been asking it for a long time. This data here just goes back to 2001. Um, uh, the bottom line, the yellow one, is the percentage of the American people that thinks abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. 20%, right? One fifth of the American public thinks abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. So when the court has repeatedly said over and over again in case after case, you can't make abortion illegal in all circumstances, right? That violates a woman's constitutional right to choose to termina terminate a pregnancy. The court has repeatedly said that and repeatedly strike, struck down state laws that go too far in restricting abortion. That's not an example of judicial tyranny, right? That's the court and the public are in the same place, right? Most of the public thinks or, uh, anywhere from 58 to 50% 50 of the public quite consistently over a long period of years thinks that abortion should be legal with some restrictions, right? Another 20 to 30% of the public thinks it should be legal altogether with no restrictions, right? This top line is exactly what the court has repeatedly held. Some restrictions are allowed, but abortion has to be legal, right? The court and the American public are in the same place. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to overstate the case. Um, and I have a couple more slides that I think I'm going to skip for purposes of time. But I do have some other, I have some examples where the courts have done things that the public does not support, right? Um, including both on abortion and gun rights. It occasionally happens. And also on some other issues uh, um, that I've studied. Um, so it's not that the courts never do anything that the public uh, uh, doesn't support. That would be surprising. But the way I would put it is that um, the, uh, the courts, um, let me put it this way, political actors on the left and the right regularly and routinely ask courts to intervene and help settle divisive political conflicts. Judges on the left and the right regularly and routinely grant those requests. Not all the time. You don't, the litigators don't always win, right? The judges reject a lot of the requests too, but there's so many of the requests so constantly that if the judges even accept some small percentage of them, it's a quite regular occurrence. Judges on both the left and the right regularly and routinely um, uh, uh, um, grant such requests and intervene to try to settle a divisive policy and political conflict. And most of the time, not every time, but most of the time when the judges do so, they have broad public support, right? That most of the rights that are protected by judges on both the left and the right, abortion rights and gun rights, most of the time when judges step in to protect those rights, they have broad public support for doing so. Um, are, are they simply just applying like the rules of Major League Baseball, a clear set of rules that are written down that everybody can read and everybody should theoretically apply in the same way? No, clearly not the case. But are they just like making stuff up and imposing their will on the country at large? Also no, that is clearly not an accurate description of what the courts are doing. Let me stop there and uh, I hope we have some time for questions and discussion. Should I call on people, Angela? Or you want to do it? Should I use the mic? Do you want to use the mic? So I don't know if I can ask my question coherently, but I will try. Um, so if the Supreme Court is more often than not supporting the public's wishes, is that a result of the um, balance of power on the Supreme Court rather than a specific judge well of course yeah. Well, for sure. So, like, no one justice can like control the court's decisions by herself. Um, and if he or she could, that would be potentially problematic because there are some justices on the Supreme Court whose views are much further away from the views of the median voter, right? But the, that one justice by herself can't do anything. And so, 
there's no guarantee. I guess the, the way I put it in the book, the way I, the way, one way I think that's helpful to, to think of it is that the problem, the thing to be afraid of, but the way a lot of people talk about courts is like as they're scary, right? Go back to the beginning. Federal 78, the whole tone of it is don't worry. The courts are not that bad. You don't need to be afraid of them, right? The thing to be afraid of is not that we have powerful and independent courts that sometimes enforce constitutional rights, right? That is like a deep-seated feature of American democracy that the public broadly supports. That's not anything to be afraid of. The thing to be afraid of is if the courts get basically captured by one side of the country, right? And controlled to such a firm extent where it's not a single justice doing it, but it's like a block of justices who all basically agree with each other. And then, they, then there's less constraint, right? Then if, if the courts basically get captured by a single partisan coalition, there's less constraint and there's more ability to, so if the Republicans had firm control of the federal courts, they could protect gun rights more actively than the public supports and protect abortion rights might much less actively than the public supports. There have been, in my lifetime, there's been re repeated occasions where one party has been on the sort of verge of pretty full control of the federal courts, but it's never quite happened, right? And then the other party wins an election and that new president gets to appoint some judges. Um, and so it, it's not quite come to that. No. <laughs> so my question is, is that um, I've, I've watched all the debates. I'm, I'm listening to multiple channels and reading multiple articles. I would like to know what your uh, opinion is or assumption is in regards to who will be the next Supreme Court based on who's going to be president. How is that going to change not just these two issues, but multiple issues that are sitting in the Supreme Court today sure. that actually will have a, a greater impact on the generation that's sitting in this auditorium today? Sure. So there's eight justices on the Supreme Court right now. Four of them were appointed by Republican presidents, and four of them were appointed by Democratic presidents. And to an unusual degree, the court is evenly divided. I, again, I don't want to overstate that. The court, uh, about 30 to 50 percent, it varies a little bit year to year, but 30 to 50 percent of the Supreme Court's decisions are unanimous, right? A significant chunk every single year of the court's decisions are unanimous. They really care about like technical legal issues, which sometimes the judges are like all on the same page about, right? But every year, there's also some highly polarized, highly divisive political controversies that come to the court on which they tend to be divided. And at the moment, they're divided four to four. Um, uh, so that even division will tip one direction or the other when a ninth justice joins the Supreme Court. Um, uh, I'll give, there's, there's lots of hypothetical examples that could come to the court over the next year or two or three or four. I'll give one, I'll give two real quick. Um, that we know are coming. So um, earlier this year, the court heard a legal challenge um, to uh, President Obama's immigration order, right? So President Obama, um, a, a couple years ago, had issued an order, um, uh, an executive order, um, basically involving uh, DREAM Act children, right? So the DREAM Act is a stalled piece of federal legislation that Congress has never enacted, which would say, which would say um, that if you came to the United States as a child, Right? Even if you came illegally, if you were an undocumented immigrant, but you came as a child, and if you had stayed in school and done well and gone to college or joined the military, um, uh, you could get legal papers to stay in the United States. So that was a first executive order. And then President Obama issued a second subsequent executive order um, that applied to many of the parents of those children, as well as some other categories of undocumented immigrants. That second order was challenged as unconstitutional. The challenge came to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court didn't decide it because it was divided four to four. So that challenge is still up in the air. Really? And as soon as the court has a functional, working, full complement of nine justices, a similar case could bring that issue back to the court. Uh, another huge issue that came to the court in a kind of preliminary procedural move um, last year, um, where the court was split four to four, uh, is an issue regarding climate change. Um, it again involves an order issued by the Obama administration, in this case a set of regulations uh, issued by the Environmental Protection Agency known as the Clean Power Plan, which is an effort to impose much tighter restrictions on coal-fired power plants and the like that are contributing to global climate change. Um, there's a legal challenge filed by coal operators um, and the court is divided four to four and they just can't decide the issue at the moment. So those are two direct issues that have an enormous impact on millions of people that the court at the moment is unable to decide. Um, I think the next justice 
on the Supreme Court is, if I had to bet, it's going to be Merrick Garland. I think he'll get confirmed in December. And then I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer will each step down over the next two years. Um, and you will have a Democratic majority on the Supreme Court for the first time since 1969. And that's like, you guys, most of you guys weren't even born. I wasn't even born in 1969. I was born in 1970. So like, that's great. So like, think about this. From 1968 to 1988, Republicans won the popular vote for the president in five out of six presidential elections. And they pretty quickly turned that into a Republican majority on the US Supreme Court. From 1992 to 2012, Democrats won the popular vote in five out of six presidential elections. And we still don't have a Democratic majority on the Supreme Court. We've got four out of eight. So that's not a majority, right? That's unusual. There's been a, there has been a shift in electoral terms. There's been a Democratic shift in recent election cycles, at least in presidential elections. And that has not yet fully translated. That is supposed to translate over time into a shift on the Supreme Court. And that shift has been really slow in coming. But I think it is now on the horizon. There was a hand in the back, I think. No? Well, you said there were a couple of times or sometimes when the court was on the verge of taking over one yeah. side or the other. Can you give an example of what the repercussions were or would be? Sure. So the, the, the best example uh, most recently, I think, is that um, uh, so after George W. Bush served two terms as president, um, there, were, uh, there were two Democratic appointees on the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer. And uh, uh, don't quote me on these because I'm going on memory here. But I want to say that um, uh, something close to 60% of federal judges as a whole were Republican appointees, right? So there were a lot of Clinton appointees on the federal bench, only two on the Supreme Court. But on lower courts, there were still a lot of Clinton appointees. But there were still a lot of Reagan appointees and the first President Bush and then the second President Bush had served two terms. So there were a lot of federal judges, significant majority of federal judges, including seven of the nine Supreme Court justices, had been appointed by Republican presidents. And so if John McCain had won the election in 2008, right? Then he would have appointed a couple additional Supreme Court justices, and he would have appointed, you know, like 100 additional lower federal court judges. And the numbers of Democratic judges would have been down to like 35%. I don't know the exact numbers, but it would have really, like a th only a third of the federal judiciary would have been Democratic appointees. That would be a real sh significant shift. That would be unusual. My, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say my hunch is that you wouldn't see anything that significant unless you went back to FDR, right? When FDR was elected four times in a row, right? And then Harry Truman finishes his fourth term and then gets elected again, right? So there's a lot of Democratic appointed judges back then. Although even then, I think it's not really comparable because we didn't have the same degree of partisan polarization during the New Deal era that we have today. So in the, in the mid 20th century, there are liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats, and there are liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans. That's much less true today, right? So the fact that you had, if two thirds of the federal judges were Democratic appointees in the 1940s, that wouldn't tell you as much about how those judges are voting as it would tell you now, because some of them would have been right, racist, segregationist, Southern Democrats, and some of them would have been liberal, New Deal, Northern Democrats, right? And so they're not all deciding cases in the same way. What do you think would happen if, uh, say, the Supreme Court were to rule an executive order constitutional, but a Republican legislature tries to undo it? What kind of gridlock would, could that potentially cause? Um, so it depends on the details, right? So um, uh, under our Constitution, we have three separate and independent branches of the federal government that each has sort of clear authority to do certain things. But then there are lots of gray areas, lots of overlapping Venn diagrams, or however you want to think of it, where there's some, some overlap in the authority. And so conflicts arise, right? So the president is commander in chief of the US Army and Navy, but only Congress has the authority to declare war. That predictably and intentionally, on the framers' part, creates conflicts, right? And so um, throughout American history, from the very beginning, from George Washington forward, right, um, presidents have sometimes done things unilaterally, 
that members of Congress thought the president wasn't allowed to do unilaterally, right? It happens over and over again. Um, and it is for sure happened in the Obama administration. Um, and in particular, in the later years of the Obama administration, as the administration has gotten increasingly frustrated with congressional gridlock and inaction, right? So Obama spent, President Obama spent years trying to persuade Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform, including quite significant efforts at compromise on his part. We'll beef up border security, we'll, we'll incorporate a lot of Republican immigration proposals, but I also want to create a path to legal status and citizenship for some of the 11 million undocumented immigrants who are in the country, right? Repeated efforts to compromise and, and, and it doesn't get anywhere, so eventually, the advisors are like, well, we got to do something, right? We got, let's, what can we do unilaterally? So let's ex issue some executive orders. There's some things that they know they can't do, but there's some like pieces of the policy change that they think they can do unilaterally. Well, any executive order that the president uh, um, issues, but I'm going to qualify that a little bit, virtually any executive order that the president issues can in theory be overridden by Congress, right? So if Congress passes comprehensive immigration reform, that would displace the executive orders that President Obama has issued. Um, so President and Congress jockey back and forth. The, the interesting thing about the courts, right, is sometimes the courts will stay out of that and President and Congress are jockeying back and forth. But if the organized interests on one side or the other think they have a chance to make some headway in the courts, they'll go to court and they'll try to pull the court into the conflict and then the court can kind of weigh in on one side or the other, right? And so. If there's not enough votes in Congress to supersede President Obama's executive order, which is the case right now, right? But if we could persuade the courts to strike it down, well, then we don't have to supersede it. We got the courts to do it. Um, or if um, if uh, if if Congress, you know, um, flips to Democratic control, but if um, but if the uh, if the president or the court we're still in Republican hands, right? Then theoretically, Congress could pass a Democratic version of immigration reform that then could get invalidated in court, right? So it's the court becomes like an extra veto point, which is which is pretty regularly and routinely in our political system sucked into these political controversies, and so it it, it, it can if the president and Congress are on the same page very strongly it is unusual for the court to like weigh in and try to stop them. And even if the court tries to, sometimes the president and Congress are able to kind of push past the court. But if the president and Congress are divided, right, and it's not clear how that's gonna come out, then if the court intervenes, that can help sort of tip the outcome one way or the other. Oh, up there. Oh, we had some. Um, why can't the president get to decide who the next yes, Supreme Court justice? Yeah. So, for so great question. So, for sure, uh, there's only one. As President Obama has said this a couple times this year, there's only one president at a time, right? Nobody else has the authority of pres the presidency of the United States at the moment. Um, uh, he has all of the authority for the full term, right? All of the powers that are given to the president belong to President Obama until the next president takes the oath of office, right? He has the full powers of the presidency for the full duration of his term. That's clearly true. And there are lots of historical examples of Supreme Court nominations being made towards the end of a president's term. Um, it is also clearly true that the Senate has full authority to either consent or not consent to a judicial nomination. And that authority lasts for the full extent of their term also. So President Obama is fully within his authority in nominating Merrick Garland, and the Senate is fully within its authority in rejecting him. The thing that's most unusual about this year's circumstance is that the Senate hasn't rejected him. Like, it's one thing if you hold hearings and you dig up some dirt on the guy and you find some plausible reason for opposing him, and then you vote him down, but you've at least considered the nomination. That's happened lots of times. Um, uh, President uh, Johnson, Lyndon Baines Johnson, nominated Abe Fortas to be Chief Justice of the United States in 1968. Abe Fortas was already on the court. He was an Associate Justice, but Chief Justice Warren announced he was retiring. Johnson wanted to uh, elevate Abe Fortas to Chief Justice. He did that during an election year, and the Senate blocked it. 
but they blocked it after they held hearings. <laughs> they held hearings and they did investigations and they came up with some dirt on Abe Fortas where he had some questionable financial practices that he had been engaged in while si a sitting Supreme Court justice. Uh, and so they blocked him. But they didn't just say, we're not going to even consider the guy. That, that's the part that's so unusual this year. There's nothing, there's no, there's no way to make the Senate Republican majority agree with Merrick Garland and there's no way to make them there's no way to make them do anything but there's but it would not be that unusual if they had held hearings over the summer considered him and then voted him down which would then give the president an opportunity to nominate somebody else and they could start the process over right that would not have been that unusual but the fact of not even considering him at all is 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 quite unusual by historical standards sorry uh so if we're becoming more polarized as a nation, which is, it appears to be um, actualized in the courts as well, how do, we, how do we not continue in that direction? How do we go in the opposite direction? <laughs> um, I don't know if I have an answer to that one. Um, uh, um, I think, no, it, this has been a weird election, right? Um, uh, some, some, so to say the least. Some, some of you who are not old enough to have followed very many presidential elections, they are not all like this one, <laughs> right? Um, this has been a weird presidential election. Um, one of the ways it's been weird is that the nominees, the nominee of one of the two major political parties has not long been a member of that party, has no real formal connection to that party, um, uh, has a million issue positions that are uh, in tension with the long-standing commitments of that party, doesn't do anything that the leaders of that party want him to do, right? And so, like, if Donald Trump loses by a quite significant margin, which is what the polls currently seem to suggest will happen, um, Nobody really knows for sure what's going to happen with the Republican Party, right? They're going to have to regroup in some significant fashion. And there is lots of speculation about a potential internal civil war in the Republican Party where the leaders of the party and the base of the party can't really agree with each other on anything about what the future of the party should be. So like, how is that going to shake out? There are lots of, not lots, but there are multiple previous examples in American history where one of the two major parties at the time has sort of fallen apart and had to reconstitute itself, sometimes under the same name and sometimes under a new name where the party sort of disappears and maybe there's two factions of it for one election cycle and then one of them becomes the dominant faction and eventually we sort of reemerge with a stable two-party system. Nobody knows if that's going to happen this time around, but if something like that were to happen, that sort of shifts the normal kind of, it, it disrupts the equilibrium of existing political conflict in such a way that maybe 10 years from now, the level of polarization that we have looks very different, right? Because voters have sort of resorted into a slightly differently organized party system, right? Like, so people have talked about, some uh, commentators have speculated about, like, instead of the sort of left-right political divide that we have now, we're seeing a more kind of nationalist, like internationalist divide where elites in both parties, current elites who are currently in both parties are in general supportive of free trade and supportive of international engagement in the world. Um, and some uh, uh, party activists on the ground in both parties are more in favor of kind of hunkering down, America first kind of kind of stuff. So that's potentially a shift in the allegiances of the parties and their voters that potentially disrupts the existing patterns of polarization. But I, I don't know any way, like, nobody can, like, flip a switch and, like, make that happen. And a lot of people don't even, I don't even know if that's a good thing, if that would happen or not. Like, there's, it's complicated, right? It's quite complicated. But, the, but it, it, is, it is for sure historically unusual, by the standards of US political history, it is historically unusual the degree to which party leaders and members of Congress and, to a significant extent, voters are sorted ideologically into two distinct parties, right? Like we all, in most periods of our history, we have had two distinct national parties, but the ideological sorting has not exactly mapped up with them, right? So again, in the mid 20th century, you had liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats, and you had liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans, and that's not really true right now. And that's, that's unusual, and I don't think it will stay like that forever, but I don't know exactly what it will be that will kind of disrupt that.
but maybe this crazy election this year is going to disrupt a few things, I think. <coughs> In that case, we'll end it here. And thank you, Tom, for your talk and for coming to visit us. Thank you. Thanks, you guys.